Hello, Cancer Warriors. This is Tanya with Power Pantaloons Podcast. And today our guest is Dr. Karen Kramer. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Tanya, for having me. I'm so excited to have you. So why don't you tell the audience what your zone of genius is? Hmm, I love the way you ask that question. So I am going to give a little background and then jump into the zone of genius that I have. So I've been in the field of leadership development and executive coaching for the last 30 years, over a little over 30 years. So working with anywhere from teenagers all the way up to retirees, C-suite executives, and anywhere in between from um, the CIA up to Boeing, Nike, Google, American Express, and others, as well as stay-at-home moms. So background in leadership development and coaching, I uh, stepped out of the corporate world to work with teenagers. Then six years ago, the love of my life walked out of my life, thought I could coach myself through my own divorce, did not work that way. And then five years ago, ended up coming across neuro-linguistics programming. And that's what really helped me identify, if you talk about my zone of genius, is identifying what is going on underneath the conscious mind? Like what are those, those limiting beliefs that might be there for an individual or even more when we get into what my superpower is, which really is tapping into my intuition is getting to understand what a person is not saying and specifically is around what are some of the energy blocks that people may have, which are hindering their body from coming back to balance. Mm, so much to unpack from all of that. Mm -hmm. So for people who don't know, what is the neuro blah, 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 blah? What does that mean? <laughs> yeah, thank you. So, and I, I have a, a couple of sort of uh, master practitioner certifications in neuroscience. So what does that mean? Neuro linguistics programming or NLP, as some people know, I actually start with the middle word. It's linguistics. It's what we say gives an idea about the programming that we have in our minds, that it's also settled in the neurology of our body. So we're probably familiar with things like, I'm not good enough, I'm unlovable, I'm unworthy, okay? Some of those, those are those limiting beliefs that are there that also settle into our body. Like when I'm doing my work and I'm releasing things like, I'm not good enough, I'm unlovable, I'm unworthy, where they're actually coming back and acknowledging that actually I am enough, et cetera, you can actually see it. I, I even tell my clients, I'm like, do you want a facelift, like a more permanent facelift? It is amazing, Tanya, how when we're releasing that energy from the body, how young we could look yeah. just by doing that energy. Yeah. Maybe that's why I look 20. <laughs> all jokes aside, right? Like we always have more work to do, right, Karen? <laughs> Myself included. It's, it's a working process, which I love. So where, where would somebody start, right? Like where, where do you start with, with working on your belief lids and um, increasing them and making, making yourself the higher version of yourself? Well, I will start here with like how like people usually don't come to me on the call saying, Hey, Karen, I think Dr. Karen, I think I have a limiting belief. That's usually not where they start. Okay. <laughs> It's usually when they calling me, it's usually there is something that is going on in their life. So my main focus right now is on women who have lost a loved one due to death and divorce. That really is the primary, but then we expand it out because I say I'm a grief recovery expert. So it's beyond just grief is more than just death and dying. As you mentioned, it also gets into health related topics, right? Even I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> yeah. Even if it is like, um, my body is not operating the way it used to, like I can't squat down and get back up the way I used to. So it may be like on that end, or it may be as, as we mentioned with cancers and other things is I have, my body is experiencing these other things that are holding me back from the life that I felt I should have, especially at this point in my life. Yeah. Okay. Like one of the, one of the things I did to myself is I asked my oncologist, I said, when am I going to get my stamina back? And she went. And so what I heard was tough shit, you're done. Like, and 
honestly, I I held myself back for 15 years because of it. And a couple of years ago, um, I was able to break through that um, with the help of Gary Brecca and a gene swab that helped me methylate folate correctly and being put on supplements. And suddenly I'm, I have three times the amount of stamina that I did two months ago. It was incredible. So like transformation can happen real fast. Once, once you decide that you're done with that limiting belief. And I think part of it is obviously acknowledging that you have it. And I'd love to say it's as easy as acknowledging it and then just saying, yes, I am worthy or yes, this, but it doesn't always work out like that. Let's talk about it, that. <laughs> it doesn't. In fact, so when we think about stepping into the world of even like visualization goals, the whole idea about setting a vision board, which by the way, I've been doing vision boards since 1998. With my kids with my clients love them. And also there's a limit there. So vision boards affirmations, declaration letters, in and of themselves, they're only powerful only so far. So let me set that up to say, when we think about our mind, there are, although there's many different facets, I'm going to break it down into two parts. There's the conscious mind, everything that we are aware of. And then there is the subconscious or unconscious mind. So in the world of neuro-linguistics programming, we refer to it as the unconscious mind, Many people know it's the subconscious mind. So if I you hear me switching back and forth, it's the just same the same thing. thing. Sub, subconscious, unconscious. So conscious and that subconscious mind. However, there is nothing that stop gap, that flow in between. Well, let me step back here. Conscious mind, everything we're aware of. Unconscious mind is that heal and feel. It is the one that, that runs our involuntary body. So we don't have to think about breathing or pumping our blood or blinking when we need to. Our unconscious mind runs that. Our unconscious mind stores all the um, emotions that we have. So it, it stores all of our events and things, almost like a Rolodex. I know I'm dating myself here, but Rolodex of different like events that we've had in our life. Um, it stores that information that's there. Also, it's the one that's there to keep us safe. So that whole fight, flight, and freeze response, or even fawn response, all of that, it comes from the unconscious mind. It's like if you were out in the woods and you run into a bear, consciously, you're not going to think bear. Bears are scary. Bears can eat me. I should run. Because if your mind does all that on the conscious level, the bear's going to be upon you and eat you before you take your first step, Right. But on the unconscious mind, it like quickly knows safety, psychological, physical safety. I'm either going to fight, flight, freeze. I'm going to do something to get myself out of there. So that's that unconscious mind. However, somewhere under the age of seven and 10, various different theories, but seven and 10, somewhere around that time, we developed this, what's called the critical faculty. That's kind of the stop gap. It's a critical factor, critical, there's other names for it. Critical filter is another one. It's that, that, that stop gap in between our conscious and our unconscious mind. What does that mean? Somewhere under the age of seven and 10, we take in things, we're a sponge. We take in things uncritically and take them in and make beliefs about ourselves or in the world without really thinking about it. We hear mom and dad talking about finances and how making money is hard. We take in a belief about making money is hard. If Can we, I return that one now? <laughs> I, I would like to return that library book back out. That, that needs to go. <laughs> Yes, yes. I was even talking in a in a um podcast earlier today about all those beliefs that I had taken on, like for my, my parents. So I was born to my parents late in life. They were born in the 1920s. Think about those who were born in the 20s and the 30s who experienced the hardship of going through the depression. Depression. Right? Like my dad was, he was the oldest of three boys, alcoholic father, mom left at 12. He was the one who was in the 40s because he was born in 1922. So 1934, he's a 12-year-old working as a busboy in the local restaurant, bringing home scraps of food to feed his two younger brothers and his alcoholic father. So play it forward 
is he played out some of the programming, again, depression, scarcity, mindset, programming, lack mindset that also started to play out for me, even though I was living in a different era, I had to replace some of the programming. It costs too much. Okay. But it's not worth it. I'm not worth it. Okay. So think about how we might even shift around some of those beliefs. It's not as easy as like a return to sender, right? It's we take on what that is critically about ourselves. So a point you made earlier, Tanya, is we may not know. We don't walk around knowing that, hey, I'm walking around with this. I'm not enough belief. We're at, it's just something that acts out in the world. Yeah. How do we figure out? what the limiting beliefs are like can we start with that because <laughs> yeah. without just guessing right like obviously you 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 take stock of your life but there's stuff you you don't remember ever happening right like mm -hmm. when you say the ages of seven to, to, to 12 I mm -hmm. my parents were getting a divorce mm -hmm. and so there was a lot of that going on at, at but other than that, like, I don't, I don't know what else I picked up, but no, I do want to put them down because I don't want to carry them. <laughs> and you have a very good point. So a couple things that you're asking me here, I'm switching around water just for a purpose here. First of all, the beliefs are not something that we walk around and saying, oh, I believe this. I believe that we just act up on them. And I can share a, a story here just to give an example. The other thing is when you said put them down, if we think about, and there's been an analogy out there about a cup of water, like, okay, then here's a full one. Okay, like I have a cup of water. And if I was to ask you or the viewers, how much does this cup of water weigh? That actually is not the right question because whatever it weighs, I don't know, pound or two, whatever it weighs, is not necessarily the key. But if I was to hold my arm up like this with the same glass of water for an hour or two or three, the weight of this glass with water it's in it heavier. is still the same. Yeah, my arm tires. So to your point, how often do we carry around certain beliefs about ourselves, certain traumas, certain emotional, past significant emotional events, certain triggers that we're literally carrying around in our life that are we're acting out all over the place, but we don't know what those are. So in answering your questions, some of the key questions that I ask my client, and again, a lot of this is word patterning to get an idea about the programming that's settling in the neurology of their body, okay? It, that's part of my training is looking for nonverbal and verbal word patterning. One of the questions I ask when a client presents a problem for me is, question is, how is that a problem for you? I'll give you an example. A most recent client came to me and was talking about her, in this case, getting a divorce and um, complaining about some things that her ex was doing. So question, how is that a problem for you? Because we tend to want to point the finger back to that person. My ex is doing this. And how is that a problem for you? How is that a problem for you? By that questioning, and again, it's not in a facetious way. It's not, not how's that a problem for you? How's that, you know, it's not one of those. It's gently piecing back for her, recognizing like, yeah, I'm giving my power away. Yes, I'm, you know, more of a realization about what's underneath of that. Why is that situation that's happening in my life? Truly, why is that a problem for me right now? That helps unearth some potential limiting beliefs that are underneath. Another question that I love. So how's that a problem for you? The question. Another question that I ask, for what purpose? We tend to say, why is this happening to me? Why did I get this, this medical result, right? Why did my tire break down? Why, have, why is the love of my life walking out of my life? Why did this person die in me? Why that? Why is that happening to me? The question is, for what purpose is this happening to me? What is there around the ick that's happening in my life? And is there anything that I can learn as part of this process? 
that may be a cycle for me that gives a window into the belief or things that are underneath of my unconscious mind, that this event that is happening in my life is to raise awareness. It's to be that window to an opportunity for me to identify it. I see you nodding, Tanya. Uh, well, right. Like one of the, one of the things that I, that I talk to my clients about is specific, how, how did your actions contribute to where you are now? Like what, what, what did you do or did not do that caused you to be where you, I'm not saying that you caused your cancer, right? Like, that's not what I'm saying, but yeah. what are some of the things that you did to contribute towards that? Like for me being overweight and not dealing with my sexual assault trauma for decades, right? And not eating the best, you know, the these these things contributed towards that. So so while you were talking about that, I'm like that that's crucial, right? Like yeah. 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 Why? Mm-hmm. It's not mm-hmm. happening to me. It's happening for you. Mm-hmm. And learning how to transition the verbiage is super important you know when you were talking about um the oh my brain buffered i have no idea where i was going with that (laughs) one of the one of the yes well one of the one of the one of the side side quests that i now get to go on um post-cancer is sometimes my brain just and that's okay. And learning how to live with that in the body I have now, there there's definitely things that happen post-cancer that are difficult for people to deal with. Some of the things that I got gifted with is, is brain buffering. Um, another one of the things that happens for me is, is uh, accidental poops. We have poops in it. And, uh, learning how to be grateful for the body I have, right? Sometimes it's really, really hard walking your talk, right? Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> We're humans, yes. And it's messy. Being humans can be messy in many different ways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I like to remind myself that I cannot control the situation. I can only control how I respond to it. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in some cases, how some of the lessons may be more of a test of how do we respond? How can we respond when our body's not operating the way we want? How do we respond when our brain is not coming up with the right thing? Is it possible to, and these are just throwing, I'm just throwing these out as an example. Is it possible that the train of thought you were going down was not the right thought and that it created creates an opportunity for you to go down a new thought that is more in alignment with who you are and where you want to take this podcast like who knows you know how that is happening for you yep and and I may remember it later I might not and I (laughs) I have learned to live with that you know what one of the one of the most humbling experiences that I had while I was going through through my my cancer journey is my my sister and I and a couple of our friends were walking around in town and somebody approached me and they called me by name and they clearly knew who I was because they started a conversation and I had absolutely no idea who they were and at the time my absolutely wonderful response was to burst into tears and run away that like and to this day I still don't know who that person is and I I don't I can't I remember the incident but I don't remember the face of the I don't know if it was was male or female like I don't I don't know like I have no idea and I've learned how to get better about having conversations when I don't remember people and that's hard because I'm in the podcast world. I'm 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 interviewing people all the time, and then I, like I'll see them again. I'm like, they look familiar, and I have this wonderful, like, fantastic, in depth, beautiful conversation with these people. But my brain is like, okay, well, that's a library book. We're gonna put it over there until whenever you may or may not get that back. And I just have to take better notes. 
Yeah. Yeah. And also, and there, there are so many questions I would tease and some of them, since we're not in a session, I won't go down some of the roles to the, the questions I would ask too. And also acknowledging that, okay, yeah, the, the mental faculties are just not operating the way in which they used to. How do I then operate that way? Like what came to me, and again, this was not the same situation, but it was just a story that came to me back when a dear friend of mine, dear friend of mine from late high school on, uh, his name is Steve, and he was just, just bad with names. One of those people who like, he just, the names were not what he remembered, Selfish. right? Yeah. People knew him, loved him. Would, it doesn't matter where we were going. And this is like, we were 18, 19, 20. He's still a good friend, but around that period of time, like we would go to the mall, we would hang out with friends. Inevitably, somebody would come up and say, hey, Steve, how you doing? And I would just look at him and recognize the look on his face and quickly know he did not know who that person was or knew who they were, but did not know their name. Like one of those so we partnered up when they went up to him, I immediately went, well, my name is Karen. What's your name? <laughs> Which was to help him out. Um, and along, you know, along those lines, also get some of that too, because people would come up to me having worked with over 1200 individuals traveling in, in the last five years, plus all those that I've worked with would come up and say, hey, Dr. Karen, do you? and I would admit immediately, immediately, I would say, you look familiar before we go further. What's your name again? Like right get go. Like in my yeah. first thing that comes out of my mouth, because I'm like, I do not want to spill it. I just, I just make it a norm to like, I, thank you for coming up to me. I don't want to sit here for a minute, two minute, a whole long conversation. No, just giving you the impression that I remember your name when I don't, let's just get that out of the way. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, that that's, a method that I've started, right? Like I've introduced, I've reintroduced myself to people who already have met me and they're like, we've met. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I do not recall. And, mm -hmm. and I allowed myself the grace yeah. from the side effect that, that I don't know whether or not we'll ever return to a pre-cancer status and I doubt it but I you know nothing is impossible right so right. I don't want to I don't want to just burden myself with another limiting belief right but <laughs> yeah yeah it, and even to um do you mind if I provide a suggestion you certainly can okay I want to so if we if I came up to you and um, said, and along this line, like you you introduced myself to me and I said something along the lines of, we've already met before. Here's an opportunity. Thank you for reminding me, Karen, that we've met before. Like that's a different energy from apologizing for yeah. where you are right now and thanking them for just reminding you I like of that. where you are. Yeah. Different energy. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Like earlier, you know, when you were talking about the, the limiting beliefs of, of I'm not, I'm, I'm not enough and stuff like that. And, you know, we can't afford it. One of the things that we've started practicing over here is how can I afford yeah. this? And I mean, a, a, like one of the things that really resonates with me is spelling, right? Yeah. The act of writing things out spells like which spells every time you either write something or you speak it you're literally speaking it into existence and i i am very cognizant of that and i like i'll be you know i'll say something i'll be like no i take that back like i i take that like no and i teach this to you know my clients as well as my my kids and my family like with the amount of negative thoughts that we're constantly producing, it's hard to keep up with that. You just have to do your absolute best with it. Well, you can. It's all a learning process. 
It is. It is. It's all learning. There is um, Patanjali is the last name. I don't remember the first one who did some research around the balance of how many positive, positive um, statements do you need to override a negative statement? And at that point in time, it was 10 positive statements to one negative statement to balance that out. Right. So, and I love the fact that, that you acknowledge, even if there is um, a negative thought or a negative statement is reject it, send it back to sender, acknowledge it and say, okay, well reject. And what is it that I want to believe or say or take on in place? I, I want to talk about two things and I'm going to yeah. try to put a pin into both of them. There's a reason I wanted you on here is so we could talk about the healthy grief, but this is, this is super cool and super important. We'll get over there. Um, the, the study where they, they, they uh, had plants and they talked negative to some plants and then they talked positive to other plants. Like we're those, we are those plants, right? Like how you talk to yourself and how you talk to others directly affects your cells like at a cellular level and um dr moto and his water stuff you know about him right yes yeah um when you speak words at water it the crystalline structure of the water transforms into that energetic print we're what 60 70 percent water so so I don't watch news, right? For this very reason, because- I don't either. <laughs> the environment that you put yourself in, the friends that you have, the, the mindset that you give yourself is so very important. Cellular, like granularly in your cells on your, on your health. And I say this when I say, like I have literally watched somebody get diagnosed accept their diagnosis and then just go lay down. And it boggles my mind, right? Like, because, but I also understand that everybody has their own path and their own challenges and I can't make any judgments on that, but I can still be very confused by it, right? Like somebody very important to me did just that after helping me through my cancer journey. And I miss her. I miss her a lot, but yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's very important how we talk to ourselves. And I absolutely believe that you can, you can, your mind is so freaking powerful. And the reason this podcast is called Power Pantaloons is because every day while I was going through my cancer journey, I visualized putting on Wonder Woman's underwear because Wonder Woman doesn't die. And I credit this one mindset trick to like 95% of the reason I'm still here. They gave me about a 5% chance of survival. I like, it was super aggressive, super deadly cancer that I had and very hard to detect. And when you look at it on paper, I shouldn't be here. So mindset and alternative wellness modalities really in addition obviously to what my oncologist recommended the standard of care of, of, of surgery chemotherapy and radiation all of that but I was I was the crazy one that walked in with with crystals in my bra and and and, and herbal teas and aromatherapy essential oils everywhere like and my attitude yes. was an attitude of kicking cancer's ass. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And that's a perfect example of what I said when neuro linguistics programming, we talked about the linguistics, we talked about the programming, limiting beliefs, right? What you say, the programming settles within the neurology of the body. That plant example, example is exactly it. That's settling in the neurology of that plant cell. What you say, the mindset that you have, and that actually gets into one of the two clients that I have that is the poster child for healthy grief, because she was 
So I had a, as I was doing a lot of the unconscious and subconscious work, I was finding that clients were also finding their balance, their, their body was what I'm going to say is coming back to balance, like healing, but I'm going to say coming back to balance. What do I say? What do I mean by that? The first client I, when I work with my clients, when I do the one-on-one -on -one deep dive work with my clients, they come and they stay with me here at the Villa Vision Wellness and Retreat Center for three days. I get away from the environment. I do the deep work in the three days and I follow up with them over the course of the next three months. 98 to 99% of the work is done in those three days. So I did work with um, a client of mine. She had a uh, significant sadness or depression associated in this case with divorce. And she had mentioned that she had an ovarian cyst that had become so inflamed that she was going in for surgery. Okay, so set that context. But at this point in time, I wasn't focusing on the body. Um, although I would identify the body as to what energy was there, I wasn't focused on healing the body. I was just like, okay, so what message is that ailment sending us about doing the work? That, that's where my focus was at that point in time. I did the follow-up with her a month later and she kept on saying, Dr. Karen, both this, both the doctor and I were so surprised that the, the cyst wasn't there. And she kept on using the word surprise, surprise. So I said, okay, hold, hold for a minute. Did you go in for the surgery? Yes. You're surprised. What do you mean by that? For those who have had cysts, it's not uncommon for some cysts to, to recede and go away. But in this case, it had completely healed over like it was not there in the first place, to which I just said out of the out of, out of my mouth, I'm like, of course, we just remove sadness and sad and cysts are pockets of sadness. Not all the time, not in many ways. But I had worked with enough clients over five years, over 1,200 individuals to know typically cysts are associated with sadness. We reduced, your, we released your sadness, of course your body came back to balance. So that was the first one. Then I had about five days later, I worked with a client and she's the one who's the poster child for healthy grief who came to me because she was just diagnosed with stage two colon cancer just diagnosed with stage two colon cancer. So I was about to go on a trip. So I did a half version of what I typically do, a breakthrough work with my clients. So only four and a half hours I worked with her and went through my book to identify what energy is blocked in the body. That's another way in which I talk about it is what energy is blocked in the body because we have a past trauma, um, significant emotional event, trigger limiting beliefs. It blocks the body. Where in the body, I looked at information associated with cancer, colon, all this. And basically what came down to it as we were releasing it, she said, oh my God. And this is where her doctor actually said to her, Stephanie by name, because she's a poster child for the book. She's very open about it. She said, she asked her doctor, how long have I had this cancer? And he said, we just diagnosed it, but this has been in your body for five years. It had been almost five years, two months to the fifth year, which she had been carrying around the guilt of not being able to save her husband who died by suicide five years before. Let me emphasize, she'd been carrying around the guilt and what she even was telling herself back to what you were just making earlier. She said, I'm carrying around this guilt and I feel it at the pit of my stomach. Where's the colon located next to near the pit of the stomach. So when we did this work, we released that guilt associated with that, but also what her unconscious mind said, Hey, there's more Stephanie that's out there. So what her unconscious mind did was take her back and actually take her back to something she had completely forgotten about or thought she had released, which is being sexually molested at the age of six. Where is she now? She's not at a hundred percent remission, but she is now back. She's like immediately afterward, her body started responding to that, to be able to bring her body more back to balance. So she is the poster child and why I wrote this book to say more people need to understand about grief is more than death and dying. We already talked about sexual trauma and things. It's more than death and dying. It's any significant loss and unprocessed grief will settle in the body. I'm not saying it may, yes. it will settle in the body. I, I, story after story, exactly like that. Me, I, I absolutely believe the fact that, that I was assaulted for the first time at the age of five and I ended up um, 
I ended up with gonorrhea at five, right? And I believe that that is why I ended up with uterine cancer. I've I've had other women talk about that kind of assault resulting in ovarian or or whatever, right? Like all of the cervical, all all of that. But also, I like the one that really impacts me is is, is the, the the woman who had throat cancer, and she's like, because I wouldn't speak up for myself. Yes. Mm-hmm. And. and it it there's so much more that we need to learn right about healing overall but but not processing our grief and and even 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 being diagnosed with with cancer and then going through or any kind of disease right like like having a a, a major disease is a trauma event you mm-hmm. do have to process it yeah. and one of the gifts that some of us receive when we have some sort of cancer that affects pieces that define us as women or men Mm -hmm. is then having to re connect to the divine feminine or masculine depending right so the year of doing all of the cancer dance right and just being in it not not even imagining that there was a after cancer right like because I, I wasn't ready to dare to dream about the future, right? But I strongly recommend that if you're in 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 that, absolutely visualize it. So so visualize it so strong you can taste it yeah. and you can smell it because that will pull you through it. It and will feel it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like feel the sunshine on your face while you're sitting in the sand, feel the sand in your toes and the coolness of the margarita in your hand. Like, yes. like feel it yes. because it will pull you through it. So after dealing with all of that, I, I was depressed, duh, right? Like who wouldn't be? And mm-hmm. a friend of mine looked at me and of course, of course you're depressed, Tanya. Your uterus tight, tried to murder face you. And I was like, like the thing that defines you as a woman tried to kill you. And then I spent the next five years wading through that and doing the work on on reconnecting to my divine divine feminine, which is really hard in this society where everything is correlated on whether or not you can have a, a baby. Like, hello, we're not baby machines. We are complete people. And women should not be defined by their uteruses and arguments over like you know well if if you don't have a uterus you're not a woman what like Mm -hmm. it's exceedingly insulting (laughs) but having to deal with all of that I, I mean I did lose all of my hair and the first time I was called sir I don't think I handled that very well but and and it was completely an accident, right? Like, mm-hmm. yeah. I I looked like death warmed over. I didn't have any makeup on. I like I was not well, and but I was like, uh, yeah, I cried that day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I honor you. I honor you. Thank you. Mm-hmm. But this is why this is why I do this podcast, right? Is is mm-hmm. to talk about the really difficult pieces of an illness or you could be going through hard stuff without being ill right like Mm -hmm. there's multiple layers to it but talking about the weird side effects that they're just now starting to study because people are actually living longer after going through um cancer so they're actually able to see what what the radiation and the the chemotherapy do to individuals and it comes out in very surprising ways yeah yeah it does and there is um medical gaslighting this is where i'm going on this is there is so stephanie who i just talked about she chose not to go down the route. She was literally a 
eight days away from going in for doing surgery. And her mind was, and this is after she and I had done the work together. Her mind was, I want the doctors to go in and do the surgery to prove that it's not there. So I, you know, it was, and then I got her connected with a number of people. It's like, that may not necessarily be the best route for you to go. And so she had to fight to get that second and third opinion about it, like do more testing to prove that it's no longer there or it has receded. Like she had to fight for herself, that whole agency. So what she was getting was that whole like medical gaslighting, you're crazy, this is the way it is, as well as well-meaning friends and family who were concerned about her health, obviously, including her three kids, you know, concerned about her, who, who in their mind, going down the medical route was the only way to save her life, right? That was the only thing that they knew. So by her choosing to do something that was woo-woo and alternative, right? And not choosing to go down to what she should or supposed to do when you are diagnosed with this C word, right? So she was fighting against not only well-meaning friends and family who were pushing her to go down the medical route, as well as her doctors who were pushing her to go down the medical route. And she fought all against that. So acknowledging the people who also are fighting against it, because there also are other alternative ways around that, even if it is like I even heard from you, even if it is going down the medical route is all the other stuff that you brought in crystals, other things, the teas and other things to bring in. I have a good colleague of mine right now who just got diagnosed here um, with the C word here to two weeks ago, and she is making a concerted effort along with her daughter, who also is in this body of work, same work. So I helped train both of them in this body of work. Everything that she is doing to be able to work through it is non-invasive, holistic. And her daughter is actually writing a blog about it just to get this out there, to let other people know that big pharma and medical, like, they don't make money out, out, um, out of those of us who are doing alternative forms of it. They don't make money out of it. So you're not hearing about a lot of it. So just being able to those who are especially watching your podcast and going through this is just knowing there's other alternatives or in addition to. Right. I'm never going to give medical advice. I'm, I'm not going to yeah. do that. However, I'm going to tell you that for me, the right course was to do standard of care as mm -hmm. well as some of these woo stuff because my entire life I was doing the woo uh from from when I can remember I like I don't I didn't want to take the aspirin or the Advil and I but I was always always it's a little peppermint tea and the you, you know like that works for me so yeah. already pre pro my mind was programmed that the adding that was just appropriate to add that to my my treatment uh holistic mind body spirit right like emotion like all of it right like your entire i would love to see east meets west right like the 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 chinese medicine has been around forever it clearly works but i think part of the problem obviously here is um the laws Right. Like, so even if your doctor was interested in the woo, they can't, they can't, they'll, they'll lose their license. And that's absolutely garbage, like in my opinion. But if you, if you look back, if you, if you look back, there was a time where herbs and herbal medicine was the norm, even here in the U S and then a couple of dudes, we will not name them. You can figure that out, decided that pharmaceuticals needed to be the way of future medicine and everything was rewritten and all of that medicine was lost because of greed honestly um we're gonna just we're just gonna say it so yeah like there are so many beautiful modalities out there that can support and supplement you when you're going through whatever journey you're going through. And there are also people who are in those industries who are now actually helping us fight against it. 
one of those is Dr. Gabor Mate, this recent book being The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness, and Healing in a Toxic Culture. I got to meet him a month ago at a conference. So Super he is cool. a physician. He's a physician. Right now he's retired. He's in his 70s. Love him dearly. Uh, so stepping out of the world and now saying like, hey, maybe the way in which I was trained, maybe the way in which from the medical doctors that what we're doing is not is only treating the symptoms and it's not getting to the real issues. Well, because if you are healed, you not paying more money to the pharmaceuticals. Right. And, and you already heard me say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And another thing that he, and here's another thing. And I actually, so Dr. Gabor Mate and Dr. Basil Vanderkalk, I met him both at a conference. He's the, the, um, the, the body keeps the score. So phys a, a physician, psychotherapist, okay. both of them actually fighting against their, their industries to say, stop treating just the symptoms. Stop just from a, from a traditional talk therapy perspective is labeling somebody and giving them drugs. Okay. So, and also, as you hear me say this, they're like, they're fighting against doing that as the norm, the way of, of just saying like, okay, you know, you have these symptoms, you need to be go through chemotherapy and go through surgery. And that's the only route psychotherapy perspective. You have this, you're going to be a diagnosed with this and be given this medication according to the DSM. So yeah. all of that to say, they're teasing it apart and saying, we're just treating the symptoms here. Are there other ways around it and really getting into what are the limiting beliefs? subconscious, unconscious. So that's why I bring both of their books into healthy grief. And what we're doing is like, yes, there are actually people in the own industries, but here's another piece to it, Tanya, is even with, with um, uh, the myth of normal Gabor in a toxic culture, if I walk into a traditional therapist or traditional medical doctor and I'm in pain, whether it's emotional pain or I'm in physical pain, I don't want to take, have them take time to ask more questions and do more tests to try to figure out. I am coming to them as a professional because I want quick response. I want yeah. quick and instant release of my pain. So from a cultural perspective, and again, this is in general, we're also driving those professionals to say, I want you to quickly give me a diagnosis and quickly give me whatever that pain reliever is, the medication, whatever it is. And so it's this cyclical cycle that's putting pressure on the professionals to be able to come up with these that they're getting trained in. And the quickest way is to identify it based upon symptoms. I had not considered the instant gratification portion of it. Um, and I know that when you work with an herbalist or a functional medicine, you know, things like that do take longer, right? Because it, it, it's a more easy for your body, like gentle kind of, uh, healing. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have the answer, but I'm definitely part of the conversation. And I do think yeah. that a blending, right of 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 allopathic as well as homeopathic and holistic and all of the all of the things i think that that should be the future of our medicine right where 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 when you come in right like preventative care really needs to be the norm right absolutely insurance companies should be paying for the gym membership and 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 uh chiropractic and and acupuncture and aromatherapy and all of the other other things that that go along mm -hmm. with keeping it well i mean yeah. seven, 17 years ago is when i had my cancer and i did have insurance and i was calculating my my explanation of benefits and i stopped adding the number up when the insurance company paid out not was billed but when they paid out a million dollars and i was not anywhere near done with my treatment but i was like mm -hmm. i can't look at these numbers anymore they're terrifying no. to me no and it could have could have been prevented right if mm -hmm. if all of the things had been done and i do yeah. think that we really need to move towards preventative we do we do preventative is so helpful and also even getting back to something you mentioned earlier is about 
the allopathic way of doing things, looking at a holistic, there is a, still a mindset, a cultural mindset that says that these professionals are right. We should trust them. They know best. Okay. So hold that. There's still that. Yeah. And that if we want to heal quickly, this is the only route to go. And if we do it allopathically, holistically, that it's going to take longer. Actually, in some cases, it, it doesn't, it doesn't need to take longer and some don't. There are many different, different modalities that are out there. I just described Stephanie, my story, and she's one of the 30 grief survival case studies and healthy grief. It did not take hours. It took four and a half hours, four and a half hours to release that, which it can be quick. It can be easy. So again, it's changing the mindset to say that, just because the professionals are out there doesn't necessarily mean that's the right thing for us. So trust that, take agency for yourself, find out information, gather more information for alternatives. And it also doesn't mean that holistically going down that route is going to take long, four and a half hours with Stephanie. And I was able to release that tapping EMDR. There's all these other various different forms that are out there that have quick response releases to it. Yes. It's more beyond what I do. It's yeah. But it's just people don't know about it because we are so conditioned to think that this is the only route to go. A couple of things I need to say. Number one is I will make sure that we put the the links to those books in the show notes so you all can find that because now I need new books. I'm okay. sure you do too. And the other thing I want to say is one of the things that I say an awful lot on this platform is it is called a medical practice for a reason. They are practicing. Okay. Yes, they're educated. Absolutely. However, the medical field is changing extremely fast. So by the time they're out of school, they're not up to date. And you live in your body 24 seven. So you are the expert on your body. That is, uh, so when you know something's wrong, advocate for yourself because we all know that I like to talk about that piece because I wouldn't be here if I did not. My only symptom was heavy heaviness in my abdomen. There were no markers in my blood. My pap smear was fine. The ultrasound was fine. The transvaginal ultrasound was fine. The sonohistogram came back fine. They had to do a DNC to find my cancer and it was over 10 pounds of cancer. So when I tell you to listen to your body, I mean it. Yes. Bottom line, and I, I would have said that too, is like when the more we listen to our body, the more we take agency, we take control over it. We stop listening to other people, well-meaning friends, those who are considered experts on what should be best with our own body. Listen to your own body. Absolutely respect what the experts are saying. Oh, yeah. However, however, if your body is rejecting it, like hardcore rejecting it, look for an alternative because trusting your body is super important. And the more that you listen to what your body is telling you, the more comfortable your body will be in talking to you. Yeah. So it is definitely something to develop. And the sooner you develop that, the better off you will be. And if eventually you find yourself in a situation where you end up being diagnosed with something horrible like the big C, you're better prepared because your your body has been communicating with you. Mm, yes, 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 and yes. Erin, mm. this has mm. been absolutely a delight. Absolutely well, a delight. How can my audience find you? They can find me at Dr. Karen Kramer. Dot com. So my name as it is on the screen, minus the dot, dot com. And on there, you will find if you want to book a call with me, it's 20 minutes. There's no charge to it. Even if you wanted to chat about what we had in this podcast, I love it because I want to educate more people about ways to, and you said it perfectly, Tanya, tie in, pay attention to your body, 
the nonverbals, the verbals, the pains, the aches, whatever it is, ways in which we can tap into our own intuition, our own body, so that we can take agency around it. So we're not just blowing in the wind with whatever opinions are out there. So book a call with me if you'd like to do so. Also, when you go to that website, you will see a ribbon which gathers, which has a link to more information about healthy grief with Stephanie's story. You're also going to see the book trailer. Stephanie talks about her own story. It is also endorsed by Jack Canfield, Chicken Soup of the Soul. Um, so he's in there as well as others. So that's just more resources that are available for you. So www.drkarenkramer.com. Thank you so much for being on the show. I really, really appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. It's been a joy. And we all know what I'm going to say now, right? Make your appointments. You know, I'm talking to you until next time.